Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Hey, good morning, church. Happy to see you all here this morning. Uh, for those who don't know me, my name is Matt. I serve as one of the pastors here at Arundel Christian Church, and it is just an honor to have you, especially if you are a guest with us this morning, because we love our guests here. Right, church? That's right. A good percentage of us really love that you are here, guests. Uh, no, we are we are really thrilled that you're here checking us out. Uh, I would love to meet you if you're a guest with us on the way out today. Uh, I usually hang out in the lobby. If you come up and shake my hand, uh, let me get to know your name. That would be awesome. Hey, we are in uh, kind of part two of a two-part message. So last week we started, and this week we're going to kind of finish some things. And I'm excited about how we're going to take what we talked about last week and kind of move further into it, right? So last week we we laid the foundation. We turned to Matthew 25 in our Bibles. In fact, I want to ask you to grab your Bibles now and turn back to Matthew 25. Because if you notice, last week we read about half of the passage in Matthew 25, and we kind of stopped at verse 40. We didn't get past verse 40. And I think uh, we need to keep going. So grab your Bibles. If you don't own a Bible, uh, you can keep the Bible that you find in the chair back in front of you. Just write your name in it. If you need to borrow that Bible today, that's great. Matthew 25 is where we're going to be, and uh, I'm excited about that, uh, about reading it and explaining it, and, and there's some, some hard truth in here. You know, it's, uh, I don't know if you noticed, remember last week we talked about how, how the kingdom of God, it talks about like there's a shepherd, and the shepherd takes the sheep and puts them on his right and the goats on his left, and we kind of talked about that a little bit last week, but we never talked we, we talked about the sheep, but we never talked about the goats. We talked about kind of the really positive, like cheer, celebrate side of the story, but we never talked about the hard truth of the goats on the left. And I think uh, that's uh, not, not a kind of a, a good way to read this passage. So we're going to keep going, all right? Verse 41 through 46, all right? We get to now the, the, the goats on the left. It says this, Then the king will turn to those on the left. Now, let, let me pause here for a moment. I want to ask you to take this really harsh patch, uh, passage we're about to read and put yourself, kind of imagine that the shepherd is standing in front of you and you are kind of next in line and the shepherd in this moment is determining, are, am I going to put you on the right or am I going to put you on the left? The shepherd is, is kind of looking at a few things to determine who goes on the right and who goes on the left. And so far we learned about, uh, remember those who, uh, when, when Jesus says, when I was hungry, you gave me some food to eat. And when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. And when I was naked, you gave me clothes to wear. And when I was sick, you helped me to heal. And when I was in prison, you visited me. And when I was a stranger, you invited me. And we have all these things that we talked about last week. And Jesus says, ultimately, uh, those of you who did something about those needs, 
You are sheep. You're going to stand over here on the right. And now we get to this. And I want to imagine, I want to ask you to be super introspective for a moment as we read this next part. Where, where would you fit into this? All right, the king will turn to those on the left. He, he's placed a, a group of people over here on the other side. And he says to them, away with you, you cursed ones into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his demons. I don't know about you, but I want to be on the right. This does not sound like the plan, right? If I'm coming up, I'm thinking, I've got to figure out what does it mean to be on the right and on the left, and how do I make sure that when, when I step up and the shepherd is looking at my life and the shepherd is trying to determine whether or not I am a sheep or a goat, I want to be a sheep, right? Everyone with me? All right. Because this is what he says. He says, For I was hungry, and you didn't feed me. I was thirsty, and you didn't give me a drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me into your home. I was naked, and you didn't give me clothing. I was sick and in prison, and you didn't visit me. And just like last week, the group is confused. They're thinking, Jesus, when did we ever see you fit into any of these categories? Right? So they say, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry or thirsty? Or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and not help you. And he will answer it this way. I tell you the truth. Here's more truth. You ready for it? When you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were refusing to help me. And then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous will go into eternal life. You see, there are two sides to this story. Now, here's the really hard part about this passage. It's really easy to read this passage and say, man, this sounds awfully works-based, right? Are you saying that if I do a whole bunch of good things and I'm really helpful and kind and I reach out my hand and help people, that, that somehow because of that work, I am going to be blessed and I'm going to inherit eternal life? And if, if I don't do those things, that I am not going to be blessed and I am going to lose out. Doesn't that sound a little works-based, right? It seems like this, this passage is saying that, that faith isn't really the determiner of, of, of faith, or, or you know, of a relationship with Jesus. So let me, let me read another passage to try to help make sense of this. Here's what John 13, 35 says. It says, Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Here's what this verse means. Hey, if you're in this room right now and you claim to be a follower of Christ, in other words, you claim to have faith. And by the way, faith is what saves you. We are saved through faith in Jesus alone, not by anything that we do, not by having more good deeds than we have bad deeds. That is not what saves you. So if you claim to be a man or woman of faith, you claim to be a follower of Christ, you claim to want to do things the way Jesus asks you to do things. You claim to love the things that Jesus loves and to hate the things that Jesus hates. Then it is going to be evident in the way you act. It is going to be evident in the way you reach out your hand to love others. Or it is going to be evident in the way you withhold and hang on to what you've got. See, the harsh truth is that the way we interact with the least of these, the way we interact in love with the world around us, proves to the world whether or not we are people of faith or not. It is all about faith. And we know that faith without works is a dead faith. Also, before I get much further into this message today, I want to share with you, there's a confusion sometimes about the difference between a command and a calling. Now, if you're not a church person, you might not hear the word calling very often. It's not a word that you would hear outside of the church. But we all understand the word command, right? If you go to work and your boss issues a command, we know that that is something that you must do. That is something that you're, you're on the hook for it because you've been commanded to do it, Right? But then there's this other thing called a calling. So let's, let's look at these two things real quick. I don't want to spend a lot of time here. I'm just going to use some logic. Number one, for a command, we know that God commissions us to be a church of action, right? We talked about that last week. Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Therefore, church, 
go, right? We are called to be a going church. We know this. This is a command. This is not an option. This isn't a if you like to or want to or can afford to. This is a we are called or commanded to go, right? Now, here's, here's another thing as far as a command is concerned. We also know from Scripture that you are the church. Here's what I mean by that. When I get up here on Sunday mornings and I say, good morning, church. I'm not talking to the walls. I'm not saying, wow, you four walls just showed up again. Good morning, building. Right? That's not what we're doing. I'm saying, good morning, you. Because the Bible says that when we gather together and we meet together, we make up the body of Christ. We are the church. Right? So if the church is commanded to go and we are the church, then what does that mean? Therefore, you and I are commanded to go. Now, you might not like that. You might not like how that sounds. You might not like how the logic works out there. But I know that you and I have all been commanded to be part of the Great Commission. Now, here's here's the the other side, this this word called a calling. Here's a few facts I think we'll all agree on. Number one, God calls each of us according to his unique plan for our lives. In other words, God has a plan for your life right now. And I guarantee you it's different than the plan he has for my life right now. The plan that he has for you, what he's calling you into is unique just to you. He's got a purpose for you that he created for you before you were even an idea in your parents' mind. All right? Here's also what we know. Uh, Just logically, right, you can't physically be in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and the ends of the earth all at once. But we, we know he's... He's commanded the church to be in those places, but we know physically that he can't call you to physically be in all of those places simultaneously in a physical sense, right? It's just not possible to be in all those places at once. We also know, right, that God gave you unique spiritual gifts, abilities, and passions. We say that often. We call it our shape, right? S for spiritual gifts. H is your heart, what you're passionate about. Your A is for your abilities, P, personality, and E, experiences. All of us have a unique shape. God has created you not only with a specific and unique purpose, but he's also uniquely equipped you and gifted you so that you can fulfill that purpose. Now, some of you right now, you know God is not calling you into public speaking. That's not something you're excited about or maybe good at. Some of you know that that the calling he has for you is is, is different than that, and that's all right. God calls us into different types of going. So that leads us to our therefore. Therefore, you are called into going in your own special way. So here's what we know. We are all commanded to go. Let me, let me, uh, let me pause for a moment. Time out. All right, church. 8.30 this morning was really tired. I think it's the rain and the time of the morning, and they were just real quiet. And I want to give you permission this morning not to be quiet, all right? Let's, let's interact a little bit, all right? We all know that we're commanded to go, right? We also know that we're called into doing that in unique ways. Some of us physically, some of us maybe uh, with our resources, some of us in, in multiple contexts and different phases of their life. I don't know what it looks like, but I know that all of us are supposed to go in our own way. When my dad used to say to me, my nickname in my house was Tiger. My dad called me Tiger. So when I was a young boy and I would, you know, be on the baseball team and I'd hit a ball, uh, which was pretty rare. I'm not very good at baseball. Um, If I'd hit something, my dad would be the one yelling out, way to go, Tiger. Way to go, Tiger. That's, man, that's a phrase my dad would say all the time. Probably said it to me way later than he should have. You know, I'm in high school. Way to go, Tiger. But here's the truth. All of us, we know that we're called to go and we're commanded to go. And whether you are called or commanded, if you don't do what it is that God's commanding you to do and you don't do it in the way that he's calling you to do it, you're being disobedient. There are different ways to go. Uh, And just like my dad would have, way to go, tiger, I want us to be a church. Man, way to go, church. There are a lot of different ways to go. And I want to share with you some of the different things, if, if last week was the truth, here's the hard truth and the, the positive truth. 
then, then this week is, remember in Matthew 25, I think it was verse 40, it says, I tell you the truth, whatever you do. In other words, now let's talk about the what are we as a church going to do in light of all the things we've been talking about the last two weeks. What are we going to do to be a church that cares about the Great Commission the way God's calling us to care about the Great Commission? So I, what I'm going to do, and remember, we're, we're going to get some feedback. I'm going to share with you a list of some of the things that we're committed to doing and have done. We've been working really hard as a staff and as a, a leadership team this week to make some of these things happen. And I want to celebrate those things with you, all right? So here's the very first thing that we have done. We have created, and I want you guys to celebrate these things with me. We've created, and by the way, uh, our church has had a missions team in the past. Um, but in the five years that I've been on staff, we've never had a missions team. But we have a missions team now. We've created a missions team. Celebrate that with me. So we have uh, found a, a competent leader uh, in Kim Berger. And she's leading our missions team. That team has been meeting for about three, four months now on a regular basis every month. And when we're talking about the missions team, I want you to know that God might be calling you to go in one way by just being a part of that team. Maybe God wants you to be on our missions team. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe you think he wants you to be on that team uh, and we disagree. But we'll figure that out later, right? If you think that God might want you to serve on that team, Tell somebody so we can walk through like an application or interview process and, and maybe you could serve in that way. And what that team does when they get together is anybody from out there who's reaching out in here saying, can you support me? I'm a missionary or I'm going on a short-term trip or we're planning a church or whatever that looks like. Our missions team is going to filter through those things and figure out where should we actually be sending our money. 10%, by the way, of every dime that comes in through offering is immediately set apart in a separate account for missions. We do not touch it. We do not use it for this, for this building. We use it for ministry going out into our local, national, international community. And one, one family, we just kind of landed on it just in this past week. They found out that we're now supporting them. Uh, this is, uh, let me introduce you to the foster family. So these are the fosters. And the fosters are doing ministry in Honduras through Buena Vista Sports Academy. They have a ministry where young people come and through sports, right? They, they love sports. They love soccer specifically in Honduras. They go and they, they kind of go into the ministry through, through soccer and then they get to meet Jesus and they get to hear about the gospel and get their needs met. It's a really, really cool thing. All right, so that's the, the missions team. A, a couple ways you can go, right? Apply to maybe be on that team, pray for this team. Here's another thing that we're committing to. Celebrate this with me. We are going to change as a church to be more balanced in our missional giving. Celebrate that with me. Here's what I mean. Here's what I mean by this. We are going to, 10% uh, right, of everything that comes in uh, goes straight into missions. And we are going to be a church that makes sure that the money that goes into that fund is, is given out into the Great Commissional like, command in a balanced way. That parts of it are going locally, parts are going into church planting, and parts are going into international missions. And specifically, we want to be balanced. That's right. We want to take the international funds that come in and make sure that they are earmarked. I would say at least 50% of those funds are going within the 1040 window to reach the 90 5% of people who don't yet know the name of Jesus. And my personal goal, by the way, is by 2022 that we will be spending $200,000 a year on missions as a church. And I... Um, we have a, uh, some work to do. Right now we're, uh, we're a little over 100000 going into our mission fields. Um, but we, I, think we can, I think we can double it, uh, and I think it's going to be awesome, and I want you to be a part of that. Uh, ways you can go, by the way, in this, in this thing would be continue to be generous. If you're not generous right now at ACC, start being generous. As you give to this church, you allow our missions team to figure out who can be blessed through your gift, and uh, we'll continue to do that. Here's another thing we're, we're committing to. Celebrate this one with me. We're going to start planting some churches out of Arundel Christian Church. Now, what I don't mean here is that we are going to specifically uh, feel called to, you know, we're going to pick someone and they're going to go and we're going to do that. No, 
Right now, I don't think God is calling us into that specific uh, type of planting. But what I do believe he's calling us into is to allowing some of our missional giving to have some strategic partners that we know are called into planting and say, we want to financially support what you're doing and make that happen. We want to be a part of what God's doing in your neck of the woods. So we're going to be a church that is committed to helping plant churches across this nation and across the world. We're partnering with an agency called Stadia, and Stadia plants churches in the United States and plants churches all over the country, specifically Compassion International churches that are going to be Compassion projects in the future. It's a really, really cool thing, and we are committed to being a part of that. Here's another thing. This one's really exciting. Maybe you've already seen it, but when you walked in here today, uh, if you go into the cafe on your way out, uh, maybe you'll see it. Uh, we have a brand new missions wall. Still waking up. Hey, guys, when you come in here on the way out, we got this brand new missions wall. Now, many, many of you have been saying, like, Matt, we don't even know where our missions money goes. Like, when we, you say that 10% goes to missions, but we don't know, what does that mean? Like, where does that money go? Well, we wanted to communicate in a way that's interactive. So we have a brand new missions wall, and on that wall there are clipboards, and it's, it'll show you the ministries that we're currently supporting. On each clipboard, there's a one sheet of piece of paper, a stack of them. That if you take one of those pieces of paper, it'll tell you about that ministry. You can take it home. It has prayer requests on it, so you could be praying for that missionary family. You could be praying for that organization. We want to communicate regularly, and we're going to commit to updating that on a regular basis so you know when a, a missionary of ours reaches out to us and asking for prayer, we're going to pass that along to you through our missions wall. So we want you to be praying for our missionaries, our churches that we're helping to plant, and uh, all the organizations in this community. Speaking of com uh, community organizations, uh, I'm also excited to announce that we've, we've recently been approved uh, all through uh, IRS and all, that, that, uh, all the paperwork that you have to do. Arundel Christian Church is now not just one 501c3. We're not just one a nonprofit organization. We're now actually two uh, nonprofit organizations. We have this brand new 501c3 called Harvest Resources. And everything that happens locally out of this church, all the things that are happening on Tuesdays, Stephanie Evans' ministry that's happening on Tuesdays, our food pantry and our uh, community lunch and all those things, and a lot of the benevolence and the ways that we bless this community are all going to be filtered through Harvest. And here's why. There are a ton of grants that churches aren't eligible to receive funds from because they're churches. But when you are Harvest Resources of Anne Arundel County, you can ask for those grants and you can get those funds. And we're really excited about all the ministry that's going to happen through Harvest Resources. We filled out all that paperwork, and we sent it in, and we were using a company, and they said, listen, here's what's going to happen. You're going to send it in, you're going to get a provisional license, and then they're going to send a bunch of questions, and this could go on for months, maybe even a year or more. Uh, so do not expect to get immediately approved. We sent out our paperwork, we were immediately approved, we are official, 501c3, that's exciting. All right, here's another thing we want you to know about. We are going to continue a renewed support to our local organizations Right now, I've been complaining a little bit that it's been off balance, that I feel like we've been supporting so many organizations locally, and we haven't been focused on church planting and on international missions. Well, I don't, what I don't mean from that is we're going to take and stop supporting the organizations that our heart beats for in this community. We're talking about the Pregnancy Clinic, the Way Homes, Arundel House of Hope, Harvest Resources, and others. These ministries are ministries that we still care very much about, and we are going to continue to support them. And one of the ways you can go and participate in that is, is volunteer in these organizations. Give. As you continue to be generous, we'll continue to, to be able to pass those blessings along to organizations that matter in this community. All right, here's a, another one. These, these next two are kind of the big ones. When I said I have some big announcements for you, uh, so if you thought we already covered those, we are not there yet. Uh, here, here's another one I'm really excited about. As a church, we are going to be partnering in a much bigger way, I'm going to tell you more details in a moment, with Compassion International. We're going to be a church that has a heart specifically for those who have real needs throughout our world. I want to in introduce you to a guest speaker. Jean, if you wouldn't mind joining me up on stage. Uh, everyone, this is Jean, Jean Cherry. Can you show him as much excitement?
John is from Haiti. Yes, sir. And he uh, is, uh, ultimately, you were a child in the Compassion Sponsorship Program. Right. And you're going to tell us more about that story, about what happened as you were sponsored, and we want to hear more about that. And then after you're done, I'm going to tell everybody what that means for us. Absolutely. All right? Good deal? All right, go for it. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Pastor Matt, for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, as Pastor was reflecting on that passage, what came to mind for me was that the fact that uh, Jesus is talking about how a single action can make very important impact. And when I think about that, I think about my life before and after compassion. As you just heard, I was born and raised in Haiti, and most people who uh, know about Haiti, who have heard about Haiti, know that Haiti is a poor country. And indeed, Haiti is a very poor country. Even as I speak here this morning, there's a lot of chaos going on in Haiti, a lot of po political unrest going on in Haiti right now. But I would be remiss if I didn't tell you that there are people in Haiti who are living the good life. They drive the latest of the luxury vehicle. They live in mansions that you will not even see here. Um, but that's a small sliver of the population. For most people, it's a difficult task every day to feed their kids, put food on the table, and send them to school. And that was my situation. See, growing up, I knew poverty firsthand. See, poverty is the kind of thing that you can think about, you can hear about it, you can read about it, but you don't really know what poverty is unless you've actually experienced it. It's like, it's like the person sitting next to you telling you, I am starving. If you've never been hungry yourself, you might think you know what they're talking about, but the reality is you don't. Growing up, I experienced poverty firsthand. I remember the days when my hardworking parents woke up and they wanted desperately to feed us the kids, but there's nothing around the house for us to eat. There were days that we wanted to go to school. We didn't have uniforms to wear to go to school. We didn't have shoes to go to school. We didn't, we, there were days we wanted to go to church. We didn't have clothes to wear to go to church. And so growing up, there was poverty all around me. But one thing I remember is that when you grow up in poverty, you learn the value of education. And growing up, my parents drilled it into my head that, John, you want to be educated because education is that reliable vehicle that can get you out of that poverty-stricken lifestyle into a better life. And so growing up, I naturally, I wanted to be educated. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be an engineer. I wanted to be someone because I didn't want to spend the rest of my life in poverty. But when I looked around me, reality hit, hit me. I realized that there were kids a little bit younger than me, a little bit older than me, kids my age who desperately wanted to go to school, but they couldn't because their parents simply didn't have the little bit of money that they needed to pay for them to go to school. Back then, it would have cost maybe 15, 20 US dollars for them to go to school. When I realized that as a seven-year-old kid, I was heartbroken. I was terrified. I was crushed at the fact that my parents may never have enough money to keep me going to school long enough for me to become that educated person, for me to break out of that poverty that was so, so thick around me. I was desperate until one day. I remember that day as if it was, as if it was yesterday. I remember uh, my, the little village that I grew up in, there weren't that many cars that came through the village. So when a car actually showed up in that village, everyone noticed. So that day, I remember that car came into our village. I remember even what the car looked like. Um, it came to our church, and my school was down the street from our church, that group of people sent for a group of us from the school. They brought us to the church. And when I got there, I got really excited because they started taking my pictures. See, today, taking a picture is no big deal. Most of us or everyone has uh, camera phones, smartphones. Taking a picture is no, no big deal. But back then, taking my picture, that was huge for me. So I was very excited that they took my picture. I took my picture afterward. They started putting names on the list, and somehow my name got on the list. And then at the end of the day, that went, that went away. I still didn't know what was happening. Until weeks later, that my parents found 
the news that literally changed the course of my life. They found out that someone by the name of the Lutheran ladies decided to sponsor me. I still didn't know what that meant until months later that I, I realized that what was happening is that the Lutheran ladies had decided to pay for me to go to school. And all of a sudden, whether my parents had money to, to give us food to eat, put clothes on our backs, or whatever else, I didn't have to worry about that. All I had to do was stay focused, do my homework, study hard, and my dream of becoming an educated person was within reach. I was excited. If you had met me that day, you would have thought that somebody gave me a million dollars. That's how excited I was. The Lutheran ladies stuck with me all the way through high school. I remember there were days that it was time to take our final exams, and I would show up at school, and there would be hundreds of kids in front of the gate of the school that couldn't make it past the gate because they, their parents hadn't been able to pay for them. And I would show up to that gate, and I'll tell the, the gatekeeper, I'm a compassion child, and that gate would miraculously open. I'll walk on campus and take my exam. You don't know how important that was to me. After high school, God opened the door for my entire family to move to Miami. I got to Miami, and I wanted to go to med school. I didn't know that you had to go to pre-med and do all this stuff. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to go to med school. But sometimes we have our own plans. Sometimes God has other plans for our lives. About a year after I moved to Miami, I found myself on a military base in Texas in the military. Um, I spent four years serving in the Air Force, and while I was in the Air Force, uh, God made it possible for me to start going to college. I got my associate in biology in preparation to go to pre-med. After my four years in the Air Force, I went back to Miami, Miami and started attending the University of Miami. And three years later, I graduated with a bachelor and a master in biomedical engineering. <laughs> Praise God for that. Praise God for that. It was around that time that I started going back to Haiti on mission trips with my church in Miami. And God, as I was relieving the life that I had left behind, God started really impressing on my life, on my heart, that, John, I didn't bless you this much so you can come in the U.S., live in nice houses, drive nice cars. I want more from you. By then, I had gotten married, and my wife and I, we started praying. And through prayer, we realized that God was actually calling us to go back to Haiti to a small village that I was very familiar with that, that was very impoverished, um, impoverished to go and help some kids. Um, I went and visited the, the area. I came back and told my wife that this is what I see. And um, we decided that we need to, st to start a school there. So we went and emptied our saving account, the little bit of money that we had. We took that, purchased a piece of property, and we started build building a school. In 2012, that school opened, and since 2012, uh, that school has been giving the opportunity to close to 300 kids to get an education, to break free from that poverty, just like Compassion did for me. That school today runs from first grade to ninth grade. When I think about it, it was after... Um, I graduated from the University of Miami that I started thinking about the impact my sponsors had on me. I reached out to Compassion and came to find out it was the person that I knew was the Lutheran ladies. I thought it was one person. Came to find out it was actually five people. Five women from a Lutheran, Lutheran church who decided to put their money together and literally change the course of my life. And today, their investment in my life is not only blessing me and my family, but it's blessing an entire community. I call it the gift that keeps on giving. But when I think further about it, I realize that they found me just like this. See, that was me. I was just like this some 20, 20, 25 years ago. The only difference is that I think I looked a little bit better than this kid, but <laughs> that was me. No, I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> but see, they... This is how they found me. They picked up a packet just like this and decided to skip a cup of coffee, skip a bottle of water, 
and invest that money in my life. And today, not only that I've been tremendously blessed by it, but many, many people will be blessed by it, not only this year, not only next year, but for, eight, for, for years to come. And my prayer today is that God will continue to raise Lutheran ladies just like my sponsors who will invest in the life of the little kids like this so that they can come to know Christ as their Lord and Savior and so they can break out of poverty. May God bless you. Uh, my, my wife and I and my family, we've had a real heart for compassion and what the, the ministry that they do for, for quite a while. I want to introduce you uh, to two of the, the girls that we sponsor in our family we've had a chance to visit. This first picture here is Helen. My wife and I were able to go to Nicaragua where she lives and we were able to spend a day with her. Uh, we were able to take her to a mall. She'd never been into anything like that before. Uh, we asked where she wanted to eat and her, one of her dreams was to eat at McDonald's. Uh, we went and we got a Happy Meal. She went on an escalator for the first time in her life. It was amazing to watch. Uh, we got to get her some Nikes and buy her mom a, a house full of groceries. What a cool opportunity. Um, this next picture is of Alberki. Alberki is from the Dominican Republic. This is us in the DR with her. Uh, it's just a sweet, sweetheart. We just got a letter from her. One of the coolest things about compassion is you write letters back and forth. And you build a relationship, and it's just amazing. Uh, by the way, if you don't write letters, that's not cool. Write letters uh, to your compassion kids. I mean, it's, it's seriously, it's amazing to hear as we are in, the, specifically in the Dominican Republic, about how life-changing it is when roll call, when mail call happens, and know that your sponsor wrote to you. Uh, to don't be that, that one sponsor who never writes, all right? So don't do that. But here's the cool thing. We have on the outside, when you walk out today after services on our cafe counter, we have... Uh, compassion cards, but there's something real specific. Part of the announcement I want to make to today is you'll see this little symbol on them. It says church partner, and here's what that means. There's a brand new church that's being planted through Stadia in Haiti, and that church is brand new, so the Compassion Project is brand new. All of these kids are from that project. These kids had their pictures taken in the last, like, month. These kids are experiencing that excitement that John experienced when a car came into his village and said, someone wants to take my picture. They don't really quite probably even know what it means yet. But here's the cool thing. We've asked as a Rundle Christian church to say, we want to put our stamp on that church in Haiti. As a church, we want to be a church that starts building relationship with those children, that has a relationship with that pastor, that we communicate back and forth, and even better, that the children, they all know each other, they're all part of the same community, that our community is blessing that community through sponsorships. So it's a really, really exciting thing, and even better than that, all right, is this next announcement. If you sponsor one of these children from Haiti, well, another really cool announcement is starting this next year. By the way, in the, in the five years I've been at Arundel Christian Church, we haven't done any adult short-term missions trips. That's changing next year. So let me get something. Come on. So the end, uh, the, we're going to do our first trip next year for uh, 12 and up. Uh, we also are going to do two in the following years or more. And the first one we're going to do is the end of June next summer. So less than a year away we are going to take a trip of those who want to go. Uh, well, I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but we're going to here. We're going to go and hang out with our Compassion-sponsored children. We're going to be a blessing in that community. We're going to Haiti the last week in June of next year. Now, if you, yeah. And there will be other opportunities to go to Haiti and other parts of the world as we add additional short-term opportunities. But I want you to know this. Um, if, if you would like to learn more information about that trip, you're not committing to anything at this point. You're just saying, you know what, I might want to go. I'm not sure. I have a lot to figure out. If you want more information, next Sunday in this room at 7 p.m. So a week from now at 7 p.m., we're going to have a short-term missions trip informational meeting. It's for anyone who's 12 years old and up is welcome to come to that, to be on that trip. And I want to invite you into that. If God is calling you into this, if he's calling you to physically go uh, and to be a part of that trip, I'd love for you to be at that informational meeting. 
We also have other ways that we're, we're going as a church. You guys know of, of Dollar Club. Uh, that's something that's coming up soon. So make sure that you're, you're ready for Dollar Club next week. Uh, we have the Compassion Experience outside right now. It's open. So if you walk out of here today after you stop by a Compassion counter and you sponsor a child and you say, you know what, I want to go and actually experience the story of Jonathan from the Dominican Republic or Kiwi from the Philippines. I want to see what it looks like to, to live where they live and to, to, to have poverty like that. Then you can actually walk out of here today and don't get in your car. Just go right to the tent in our parking lot and walk through the Compassion Experience. It's open to you even if you don't have an appointment. It's much easier if you have an appointment, all right? Here's what we're going to do, church. This is our what now. You ready? What now, God? What do we do with all this? What do we do with this information? What do we do knowing that there are real people all over this world that are in need, that need someone to reach out to them, that want to just hear the sweet name of Jesus for the first time? What about these 25,000 children that are dying from starvation and preventable disease every single day? What about the seven times a second that somebody is being abused for their body because of someone else's sick pleasure? What are we doing about that? What now, God? What do we do? Here's what we're going to do. I've given you a whole bunch of ways to go this morning. So my reminder to you is that you have been commanded to go. That's your what now. Be a goer. Figure out what God's calling you into, whether that's calling you into a, a physical or a financial or a resource, whatever that means, locally, internationally, nationally, whatever that looks like, let's be a church that goes, not a church that sits. Let's be a church that one day the shepherd looks at us and says, hey, you, I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you gave me something to wear. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. Over here to the right. Let's pray. God, allow us to be a going church. Allow us to be a church that sees needs and can and specifically figure out how you're calling us into the command you've given to us. We know that we have been commanded to go. We know that we are to reach out to the unreached. God, we, we, we know that's not an option, but show us specifically how you're calling us into that command and allow us to be a church that puts our money where our mouth is, that puts our feet where our mouth is, that doesn't just say a bunch of good things and thinks a bunch of good things, but we put action behind it. Allow us to be a church that goes. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember you belong at ACC.